There you go. All sure. right. There we are. I'm very excited this evening that we are doing something a little out of the norm, and that's good. Don't want to do things that are too predictable in life. So uh, as per uh, coming out of a really good discussion uh, with Quan and Cynthia uh, a couple of weeks ago, we decided to take Quan's advice and read some Plato. And we're going to do that pretty soon. But before we read some Plato, what we are going to do is plunge into an investigation that Quan has been thinking about for quite some time. And this is an investigation regarding something that a lot of people have taken for granted as just, you know, a regular entertaining voyage of sci-fi in the form of a series of books written by Frank Herbert in the form of Dune, as well as another set of books, a trilogy known as the Foundation Trilogy by Isaac Asimov, neither of which, as a disclaimer, have I read. However, um, Quan has not only read, but have, has thought about this with a certain ph philosophical and geopolitical uh, penchant that we all know that Quan has uh, to, to glean certain gems and nuggets of insight out of them that I don't think most people have thought about. I know I obviously didn't. So what we're going to do today is Quan's going to share his thoughts. Um, we're going to have a, a nice open dis dialogue, um, throwing our ideas, questions at Quan. There's no obligation like usual. Standard procedure is usually I ask people to put their names in the chat box. I don't think we necessarily need to do that today. If you, if you feel like you want to, go ahead and I'll call upon you. Otherwise, I think Quan would prefer a nice organic dialogue process with all of us. So with that... Uh, I'll just pass over the baton to Quan and, and see where this goes. Hey, thanks, Matt. So, hi, everyone, and thank you for coming for tonight. Uh, tonight, I would like to discuss in a uh, free manner two sci-fi novels, one by Frank Herbert, Dune, and the other one by Isaac Asimov, uh, the Foundation Trilogy. Okay, Dune, uh, the original series, I will not talk about the sequels and the prequels, okay? The, the original series is formed by six novels, okay? Written between 1965 and 1985. The first one is Dune, the second one is the Dune's Messiah, the third one, the Children of Dune, the fourth one, God Emperor of Dune, the sixth one is the Heretics of Dune, and the last in published in 1984, the year before Herbert's death, it's Chapter House. So here is my thesis. The two novels are form a dialectical pair. What do I mean by that? Dune is the ode to close oligarchy and the foundation trilogy is the ode to open oligarchy or aristocracy. And the link with the Plato trilogy, Theotetus, the uh, sophist and the statesman, is that in that Platonic trilogy, there is a teaching for us to go to open oligarchy or aristocracy. And uh, I hope you wouldn't forgive my language, but I call Dune, high quality shit or high quality dope because it's truly well written and it's truly an excitement to read it because if you know history geopolitics psychology you would inevitably be excited by you however mm -hmm. if you are not deep enough in your epistemological advancement or adventure or journey you might be trapped into uh, admiring or uh, be uh, absolutely mesmerized by the uh, close oligarchical uh, proposition, if you will. So uh, I would like to uh, first, uh, how many people in the in our small group uh, uh, read do first? Just yeah, say I, yes, okay. Yes. I know Kevin. Yes, uh, Juan I read, it. read it. Okay, Martin read it, cool. I, I think I, I, Paul, you read it too. So, I, I, okay, I, I, so yeah, I'm certainly very familiar with the first novel, but I do remember years ago reading some of the other ones as well. Okay, cool. So at yeah. least about half of the group read the novels. Uh, sure. Not necessarily the sixth talk, though. Okay. No. I would like first uh, to mention that those who don't want to read the six novels, they can download 
the Encyclopedia of Dune, uh, who was not written by Frank Herbert, but has been approved by Frank Herbert, okay? So Dune uh, is a story spanning 350 centuries, okay? Three, 35,000 years. And those 35,000 years has been put under the main idea of the Roman Empire, or simply the empire with a capital E. And for them, they wouldn't uh, have the chronology before the Spacing Guild or after the Spacing Guild. And the zero, zero is when uh, humanity would use uh, the folding machine to, to travel through space with a special mutant kind of human beings that are capable to have a limited prescience to see into the future. So they will not get into accident uh, uh, traveling through space, okay? That is year zero. Year 2000 in that system is about 16,000 before the guild, okay? So inside that framework, we are 16,000 year before their year zero. And the hero that are called Paul Atreides, the Quisax Hadarak, or the shortening of the way in the special language of the Dune universe, will live in year 10,191 after the Spacing Guild, okay? So compared to us, Paul Atreides will live well, 16,000 plus 10,000 and something in 26 and 260 centuries in the future, okay? So it's far away and in the far future. Just to give you an idea of the space and of the, uh, of the, uh, of the quantity, uh, the central space of the galactic empire is a grid of 500, light year by 500 light year, okay? So you have to imagine some, something uh, huge, enormous, okay? And the main thesis by that series of novel is that that galactic empire is the successor of the Roman empire going through the Spanish empire, uh, the British empire, the American empire. And what is very amusing is that in the official chronology of the Dune universe, it's written, when they say the Roman Empire, you have to understand the, the Western Empire in the mind of Frank Herbert, okay? So it's written, the Roman Empire conquered the whole world except for China, which resisted till 14,500 BCE, okay? So, in their system, it corresponds to 1800 AD, meaning the Opium Wars, okay? Because once again, it's high quality dope, okay? It's a brainwashing of the oligarchy, making people believe that China has been completely crushed in 1800. And from now on, it's the Western empire that will expand to the universe and to the whole uh, known world. That's why, uh, of course, when I read it when I was 12 years old, I immediately ticked on that because of my ethno-control background, obviously. But I was truly captivated because once again, uh, it's very well written and it's very rich in culture, okay? Once again, in terms of history, of geopolitics, of anthropology, of history of religion and, so, and psychology, so on. The framework of the empire is truly the spacing guild, okay? Because once again, even the central portion of the empire is 500 light years by 500 light years, okay? So you imagine that it's a Leviathan stuff. So what are the spacing guild? Uh, no imperial civilization would be possible. That spacing guild, once again, has been created around 88 BG before the guild by a woman called 
Norma Senva. I, it's one of the character that I would name because she's important. Okay, Norma Senva or Kenva, mm -hmm. N O R M A and C E N V A. She invented the machine that would phone space. Imagine wormholes. Okay, but it's not enough to phone space. You also have to get some special humans who are mutant humans because they would eat a lot of spies that will modify their brain so they can see in a limited manner the future. So they will, they will be capable to determine the right trajectory. So to avoid accidents, of course, in space. Why I am saying that it's an ode to, to oligarchy first by the obvious identification to the idea that the Roman empire never collapse and will extend in the future to 35, uh, 350 centuries in the future. In the second point, the political organization of the empire is truly feudal, okay? Uh, I would like to say that uh, my uh, sophomoric uh, uh, attitude uh, made me invent uh, uh, an acronym that some of the, the people here know for the present uh, ruling class of the West that I call the KFC Azael. Uh, that acronym means the Kakistocratic Feudal Conglomerate of the anglo zio American Establishment. And I guarantee you that when you read Dune, uh, what they call the Landsrad, meaning mm. the group of aristocrats and of landowners ruling the empire, you will recognize at ones what I call the KFC Azael. And one, one of the noble house, it goes very far. Once again, I say, I say it's a kind of predictive programming because one of the noble house is called Grumman, okay? G-R-U-M-M-A-N. Is one of you capable to see, to tell me why Grumman is a kind of predictive programming? Yeah, yeah. I can. Yes, go. Northrop Grumman. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Northrop Grumman. That's a company making weapons nowadays. They do okay. more, much, much more than that. Yes, Absolutely. Indeed. Absolutely. Yeah, aircraft so, in particular. Exactly. That's why I make the hypothesis. Space technology. Exactly. Very advanced space technology. Exactly, exactly. That's why I say that's truly high quality dope and it's good productive programming because exactly. they, would take, they would take certain elements of the present reality and they project it in the future, the, the near future and the, the far future. Because when I get, once again, I say that psychology is one of my uh, favorite subject and productive programming is part of it, but of course, I prefer the other version, meaning the, high, the epistemological growth, because if you are advanced enough in your epistemological growth, you can be capable to see those stuff and not be mesmerized or conditioned by the oligarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to make a, a parenthesis, okay? Uh, another, it's not a novel, it's more a kind of, uh, so-called serious books, but the series by uh, Noan Yuva, Yuva Arari, uh, Homo sapiens and Homo Deus, is a kind of high quality dope too, okay? But it's not fiction. <laughs> it's yes, exactly. Dope. Well, it uh, is fiction, fiction, I think. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, I call <laughs> it high I mean, quality yeah. dope. I, exactly. I think Martin, I, I think Martin you're right, on. okay? I think, Martin, you're right in the sense that when we are in the domain of high quality dope, the line between fiction and nonfiction is quite blurred. So, and what I want to say too, is that in that uh, uh, brainwashing or productive programming, Paul Atreides is given the role of the Kwisak Haderach, okay, and that's the fun, it's an imagined language, of course. The, the Kwisak Haderach, uh, it's, it's strange. I, 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 I hear myself talking. I got it. I got it.
Okay, try it again. Okay, okay. Now I don't hear myself talking. Okay, problem solved. Okay, so the Kwisa Kadarak is in the special language of the dual universe, the shortening of the way. And I pretend that it's another predictive programming because the shortening of the gray of the way, I'm sorry, is giving to a, a kind of messiah uh, the role of guiding you rather than giving that responsibility to everyone that they have uh, to, uh, okay, no problem, bro, uh, that they have to uh, go on into the epistemological pathway themselves, each one of us, rather than uh, sub, uh, submitting ourselves to a kind of Messiah. And once again, let's not forget that the second poem of that series is called The Messiah of Doom, or Doom Messiah, to be exact. Uh, since I want this uh, presentation to be very interactive, I know there's a lot to say about Doom, but I think that you have my general idea after these 10 minutes, okay? I will go to the foundation trilogy, okay? And after that, I will open a first question in A, and if there's no, not many questions in A, I will come back to my uh, systematic presentation. The second series, once again, is called the Foundation Trilogy. It has been uh, written in, in small chapters between 1942 and 1950 by Isaac Asimov. But in 1951 and 52 and 53, uh, they, those uh, small pieces have been put into three novels. The first one published in 1951 being Foundation. The second one is uh, Foundation and Empire published in 1952. And the last one published in 1953 is Second Foundation. In the case of the Foundation Trilogy, we also have a Galactic Empire and uh, there is no direct connection with our time, okay? The time uh, being 12,000 something of the ga Galactic Empire, but we don't know where is the year zero, okay? So there is no direct connection to our time. But in that time, uh, that galactic empire began to, uh, to unravel. And there is a guy, a mathematician and psychologist named Harry Sandon, S-E-N-D-O-N. And that Harry Sandon would create a discipline called psychohistory. And psychohistory is a mix of psychology, statistics, mathematics, uh, uh, geopolitics and so on that would uh, make you capable to make calculation so that to make the period of dark age after the fall of the empire be reduced from 30,000 year to a mere thousand year, okay? So that Harry Sandon predicted the end of the empire a, a period of dark age that he predict, predicted according to his mathematical calculation that it would last 30,000 years. But he wanted to reduce it to a thousand year. And the way to reduce the dark age to, to a thousand year is to create something he called foundation, okay? Which is the Galactica Encyclopedia Foundation. But it's, it's only, a, an excuse because in reality, and here in the case of Asimov, we are closer to Plato, okay? Because uh, that Harry Sandon wanted to create a society of aristocratic man, okay? And I want to remind that for Plato, the aristocratic man is the, the man motivated by creativity, inventivity, discovery, and playful exploration. So, he wanted to create a secret society called Foundation in order to, to keep the knowledge and the right attitude of creativity and inventivity so that the period of dark age after the fall of the empire would not last 30,000 years, but 1,000 years. But what is interesting too, is that he understand that the first foundation would be responsible for more what is called the chemistry and the physical sciences, okay? The 
the uh, the mat the, the sciences uh, on the matter stuff but he want also to create a second foundation which is secret at who which would be more uh, specialized in psychology and in epistemological development precisely because when in the first 300 years after the fall of the empire the first foundation would keep the technology like nuclear power, for example, uh, running and the rest of the galaxy is unraveling and going back to uh, a lower level of civilization or simply to barbarian times, okay? But that small part of the first foundation managed to keep a kind of small running civilization, if you want. But what is interesting is that after the first 300 years, that small group of aristocratic men became plutocratic men in the sense that because they were the only one having true power in the galaxy, they dropped a bit in terms of their ideals and they were more motivated by profits, power and wealth rather than creativity and inventivity. That's what, and it was the role of the second foundation hidden on the former capital city of the empire on the planet called Trantor, T-R-O-A-N-T-O-R, who will manage to restore that first foundation. And uh, I wrote down some of the uh, stuff that uh, I wanted to say. Uh, no, 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 okay. Uh, in the book Second Foundation, there was a, an accident that Harry Sandin did not uh, predict. It was a mutant, okay, called the mule, because he was not capable to reproduce. But he had the mental power to modify the emotions of the people with whom he interacts. And by inspiring extreme fear or by inspiring extreme devotion, so you, you understand that with that kind of psychic power, he managed to control the, uh, the Rome empire, if you want. But uh, the people on the first foundation managed to vanquish him because they uh, developed more their mental capacity than him. And that second foundation uh, will uh, restore the empire or the Republic in a thousand years rather than waiting for 30,000 years. And here I would like to make uh, a return to Plato because I often say that there is a very important stage between the fake democratic man and the real democratic man. And I think that Isaac Asimov tackled that subject in a very refined and entertaining manner in his foundation series. I would like to, re to remind you guys that for Plato, uh, you have uh, six epistemological stages in the epistemological development or journey, etc. The first one is called the shadows or acacia. Okay, that shadows is your understanding of inner and outer reality only based on senses per perception. Okay, so it's body and mind, but the epistemological development is only about mind. Okay, so you have six stages of mind. So the first stage of mind is only the construction of the world and of the universe only by through the senses perception. The second stage is called Acacia 2 or Shadows 2, the intellect. Okay, here the intellect is about the concept, the images and the words, okay? Because one of the trap of the intellects that we often have uh, the illusion or the delusion of understanding something or someone just because we put a label on that something or on that someone. That's why it's also a kind of shadows, okay? And the third one is pistis. Pistis in, is a Greek word meaning belief or uh, consensus is me even better consensus, meaning it's the, uh, the truth of the whole society, okay, of experts, if you want, okay, and those are what uh, uh, Plato called doxa or 
opinion. And four, five, six are what Plato call uh, episteme or true knowledge. But here uh, I said that Isaac Asimov uh, managed to present in a very entertaining manner uh, the very subtle difference between the fake democratic man and the true democratic man, okay? The fake democratic man is at stage four, but I would say stage four A, and stage four B would be the true mm -hmm. democratic man. And what is the characteristic of the democratic man? Is the man uh, capable to understand beauty, but in the uh, timeless or eternal form of beauty, you have many things. And the first level of that timeless or platonic form of beauty is the mathematical domain, okay? So many people uh, mastering mathematics would have the illusion or the delusion of mastering ultimate reality because yes, they exactly. master because they mastered that beautiful uh, part of beauty, okay? But the, it's only the first step because let's not forget that the whole domain of beauty is not only mathematics, it's also justice, it's also courtesy, it's also kindness, it's also art, it's also philosophy, it's also literature. It's also in the, the, the vast yes. domain or the vast province of beauty. And, uh, and I would say that uh, it's probably the, the, the big mistake of the 19th and 20th century that many fake democratic men being at the stage 4A managed to uh, control or to convince the plutocrats uh, of their perspective of their understanding of the world and not uh, letting the epistemo the collective epistemological journey go deeper, okay? Is it because of simple ignorance or because of uh, malevolence? Maybe a mix of the two, okay? Uh, I, I think that we already discussed it in the, uh, in the past, but I think it's an important point that I, don't I want to repeat those stuff. Uh, uh, Bertrand Rothschild, for example, in the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, in 1911, 12, and 13, I think so, wrote a book called Principia Mathematica. Okay, he wanted to prove that mathematics is a sovereign system. Okay, and uh, later on, it has been proved that math mathematics is not a sovereign system, but it has uh, mathematics need to be uh, buttressed by a timeless form. Uh, and that is the uh, theorem of Godel, okay? Uh, meaning that mathematics as a system is a not a complete system, okay? Or in a more, in a more philosophical, philosophical way to state it, uh, mathematics is only the first step in the very big province or kingdom of beauty. And uh, why I insist on that and why I commend Isaac Asimov uh, having been capable to, uh, to, to, exp to express, to explain that little bit difficult or di uh, technical stuff by his uh, novel foundation, it's because the first foundation is precisely the people mastering mathematics. And the second foundation are the people mastering psychology, justice, beauty, literature, philosophy, architecture, those higher forms of the uh, archetypical forms of beauty, if you want, okay? And uh, why it's so important? Because the fake democratic man at 4A, they are not ordinary man, they are powerful man, they mind are more developed than most, than most people, okay? So if you don't have true democratic man above them to supervise them, uh, even to control them if you want, but supervising is maybe a nicer word than controlling, uh, they wouldn't run a market and uh, they wouldn't direct havoc across the planet because of their uh, incomplete knowledge or 
uh, their malevolence, okay? Because uh, is it simply ignorance or is it uh, malevolence, a mix of the two? Uh, probably a mix of the two. And above the, the timeless form of beauty, you have the timeless form of goodness, okay? Corresponding precisely to the famous aristocratic man motivated by discovery, creativity, uh, playful exploration and inventivity, okay? Why goodness? Because uh, the, the primary uh, engine, the primary energy of the aristocratic man is goodness, or if you want, agape, okay? That agape is a powerful emotion coming from the fact that you are enthusiastic, okay? And once again, it's not the first time that I give the etymology of enthusiasm, but it's worth repeating that. Enthusiasm means God within, okay? So those are people having the godly or God within, so they see the universe as a playground to explore, to discover, to create, and not the, uh, people that would be uh, uh, tempted by uh, plutocracy or close oligarchy, okay, which are more the temptation of the number two, okay, the people mastering intellect, okay, it's the level of the plutocratic man motivated by wealth, power, and uh, profit. And finally, the last stage of the Platonic epistemological development or journey is the stage of the philosopher king or the, the philosophical man motivated by creating aristocratic man and true democratic man. So I, I come back to my thesis that Dune is the ode to close oligarchy and uh, the foundation trilogy is the ode to open oligarchy or aristocracy. Okay, I, I have a timer in front of me, so it's almost 40 minutes and that's what I want, okay? I don't want to talk too much, just 40 minutes. And I would like to have a Q and A question and uh, because I want uh, interaction. So let's go. <clears throat> well, we got David who uh, threw in and, and again- I'm gonna jump in. Yeah, go sneaky. for it, David. Uh, but da just so people know, it's not obligatory to write your name like we usually do. If we want to just pop in a thought that enters your mind, it's a much more informal session tonight. But David, in this case, you got in uh, at the front of the queue, so go for it. I, I mean, there's a lot of things I feel like saying or I would say uh, or things that I would ask. Uh, but I'm going to start with a stupid pop culture kind of inspired question because I've only seen the movie and the Dune movie. And I, I imagine I might not be the only one, right? If other people have seen, like there's, we're in a culture <clears throat> where like people have seen the movie. Um, and I'm not that good of a movie watcher either, but what I do always remember um, is that there's that herb, right? That life herb, that uh, a mortal herb or whatnot that they're after. I'd probably have to watch the movie over, but I, you know, I'm, the details are very sparse in my mind, but um, in relation to what you've said, what's the deal with that? Yeah, uh, St Stephen gave you the answer that herbs is called the spice or the melange. <laughs> Product of the worms. What? But Dave, kept on, keep on with what you want to say, Dave. Well, I guess that was my, in terms of the oligarchy, they're just trying to control, like, isn't that one, is that one of the main themes as far as, um, you know, like the whole, how much of is being condensed into this movie of six books? I imagine a whole lot, like, is that even a significant, like, yeah, metaphorically speaking, where does, was that situated? That's my first stupid question. Uh, no, that your question is far to be stupid, Dave. It's a very clever question on the contrary, because uh, uh, it's a very deep question. Because once again, it's the question of resources. The oligarchy wanted to control the spice or the melange because the melange is a needed substance for the space navigators so they can see 
in the future in the limited manner. So it's the stuff that is absolutely essential for the economy of the galactic empire. Okay, a little bit like oil nowadays, if you want, or gas. Okay, without oil okay. and gas, there would not they would not be a global economy. So the same for the spice or melange. And as Kevin wrote in who control the spice control the empire. Can okay? I can I just interject for one second to sure. yeah, could please. sort please. of answer uh, David's question a little bit, only because uh, I mean I I I've read the books and of, of both series, but a long time ago, and never in the same mentality as as Juan has has presented. I I was more uh, like a level two person for so much of my life. But uh, the movie, the most recent, so there was a terrible movie in the 80s uh, of Dune. It wasn't terrible. No. You don't think it was terrible? <laughs> no, I thought it was excellently cast, terribly cut. They had a. T uh, well, that, that, a terrible... okay, I'll go with that. Sure. Yeah. 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 But, but the I mean, casting, I thought, was superb. The but cast, you're, uh, I, you're right. I agree. I agree. And it was true to the ideas. And any but movie with Sting is the villain. Has I agree to get some with points. Wow. But, it, but, you know, my point of, of the movie, uh, to just to answer the idea of the movie, um, neither movie, certainly the like a two hour movie, is not going to encompass the entirety of even the first exactly. novel. And, and this yeah. one, that, the most recent one, uh, it, it was only about something like a third of the novel or something. It, yeah, it, it, exactly. it's, it's going to be a three part trilogy. It doesn't give you the whole kind of feeling that even the first novel gives you. Uh, at all so that that's a difficulty if you haven't read the book and then you go to the movie it's going to be uh, probably i don't know worse or the same as never reading lord of the rings and then uh, go, uh watching the first movie um you know you just don't you don't really know mm. much about lord of the rings you just know the kind of the beginning so that was my comment about, about i'm the, also guilty of that <laughs> yeah and, and they, and i'm they, ashamed though no, no, but you know, healthy shame, not toxic. Shame. <laughs> but I want to get, I want to complete my answer to your question, Dave. Okay, because the research, the research, the spice of melange is one thing, but the other thing that is crushed in the universe of Dune is the epistemological development of the citizens of that galactic empire. Okay, mm -hmm. and that the spice melange is only the superficial stuff, but the true thing that is crushed relentlessly by the oligarchy, either the noble houses or the different specialists in that empire, for example, the mantats, uh, the, uh, the genetic experts, uh, the Bini Gesserit who are uh, expert manipulations, uh, uh, manipulators on religious uh, organization, okay? They have a stuff called the Missionaria Protectiva mm. who win, uh, uh, who in uh, uh, saw all kind of religious uh, beliefs in order to divide and rule? Okay, uh, lately, <laughs> lately Re I find very representative uh, of secret societies generally. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I would say that that that's why I said to you, David, at the beginning, that your question is excellent because yes, that the superficial uh, uh, element of uh, uh, control, the spice melange, but the other control is truly to prevent you to keep on your epistemological journey or to give that epistemological journey to a small group, the Bene Gesserit, for example, and that small group of experts are the servant of the empire and yes. of the uh, noble houses, a little bit like the, the present day technocrats that we have to deal with. Okay, imagine the WEF, okay, they are the technocrats and they are serving <coughs> the plutocrats of our planet Earth nowadays. Okay, that's the equivalent of the Ben Beni Gesserits, if you want, yes. rather, than, rather than offering that uh, epistemological journey to everyone. Okay, because let's not forget my aim tonight. I would like to, to, to excite people to read Plato, okay? Because I know that the struggle against oligarchy would not be solved. And I don't say it in a pessimistic manner, okay? <coughs> Take what I say as something realistic, okay? But at the same time, exciting, 
because the struggle against oligarchy will take at least the many generations to come. And I think that eventually people will prevail, but it will take hard work, organization, and understanding of the epistemological path. And in the Western civilization, uh, Plato is definitely a, the obvious lighthouse that I want to make some propaganda for him. I've got uh, Susie and uh, Kevin in that order. Um, I think I saw Marty's hand go up at a certain point. So then, then no, no, I'm, I'm, no? I'm, I'm, I was just scratching my head, Matt. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably ask later, but let, please have one hear the other. Okay, cool. Susie, go for it. I just want to say, oh, I'm so glad I'm here. Juan, your mind is so amazing. It really is the very first comment I made, and I can't remember what he said that made me say that, but I wrote, and therefore not be brainwashed into helping them continue to create that reality. And when you start talking about this spice, what I'm hearing from that is the fact that they seek to control our minds so that our minds are not growing like they should. So we are not creating the reality we want. We're just continuing to be their little cogs in the machine, continuing to create their reality instead. Hmm. And then when you brought in this thing about the next set of books, the foundation, oh, it's so cool. Because I wrote a question in there. I think he is writing in the form of the natural platonic progression. Absolutely. Absolutely. I barely understand these concepts. I'm just kind of along for the ride and just absorbing everything I can from you guys. But the, the first foundation is what will keep society to go ahead and function, even though everything else has collapsed. They've got these elements that will help them continue to function. And they've got this next group that are laying a proper foundation again and can even redeem that first foundation once they start going off course. You just made me hungry to read these books. Yeah, and I hope that you will be hungry to read Plato, okay? Because yes, the first I'm, foundation, I'm, I'm oh, sorry, working on people. that. <laughs> yeah. Because the first foundation is the fake democratic man and the second foundation are the true democratic man and the aristocratic man, okay? Because those are the two types of man that we need to have to win one day against the oligarchy. Hmm. Kevin, you wanna? Yeah, well, <clears throat> sorry. Um, just to uh, go back to uh, the spice subject, because I, I've identified uh, maybe three, uh, maybe teams of the, the spice. And I want to know, Quan, uh, what you think about it as a means of control, right? right. So the first one would be a mean of control of the tra of traveling, because um, as far as uh, the, the spacing guild, right, they need uh, both the spice as a fuel, so they control the fuel. And they also need it to control uh, for, for their drivers, right? So a complete control on that front. There, you mentioned the um, the psychological aspect of the drug, right? As a means of uh, as a means of control, and there's also the economic part, right? Because spices, um, well, plays the the really the 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 role of gold or oil again as a as a reserve of money, right? Throughout um, throughout the the universe. So I just want. Do you see any other um, avenues of controls that the spice represent uh, as yes. far as the empire is concerned? Yes, so it's, about also, it's about, yeah, it's also about your health because if you take the spice, mm -hmm. uh, you will be more health, you will be healthier and you will live longer, okay? Because uh, mm -hmm. the noble man in that uh, dual universe lived to 300 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, add um, maybe a sideway question. Uh, for you regarding uh, the mentats and the psychohistorians. Yes. So am I correct in my understanding from your point of view that um, the psychohistorians can be divided in uh, the true democratic man and the fake democratic man? And when it comes to the mentats in Doom, which would be, you know, in, in some sense, their equivalent, uh, 
they would only represent the fake dem democratic men. So, so those mathematicians who haven't um, uh, reconciled themselves with the Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorem. Uh, I, I think I share your understanding, Kevin, because uh, the, the people, the experts in Dune, okay, uh, you can see maybe three or four kinds of experts in Dune. The experts in genetics, okay, the being Leilax, the experts in psychology, the being uh, Ben Gesserit, the expert in, um, in, in mind, but uh, let's say in the cognitive powers, the mentats, uh, and the expert in fighting the masters of the Jinaz, the sword man of Jinaz. Okay, all these experts are all servants of the oligarchs. Okay, you, you don't see, you see nobody, even the most refined, the most advanced of them, you see nobody interested in the Republic or in the epistemological advancement of everyone, okay? It's truly, it's, it's a rich universe. It, you see that uh, uh, it's an incredible universe. I, once again, I repeat, okay, the core uh, of the galaxy is 500 light years by 500 light years, okay? It's simply uh, awesome, it's simply humongous, but at the same time, it's a very dark universe, okay? Because you feel that most of the people living in that humongous universe are slaves. And you have maybe 1% who truly are free. And even that 1% is not so free because they, they have to fight one against the other to maintain the power, okay? So, so they're not really free, uh, fundamentally speaking. Hmm. Uh, and in the trilogy, uh, in the foundation trilogy, of course, you see people who are too obsessed by the mathematics, by the prediction, by the more mathematical dimension of cycle history. And you see people who are more advanced, uh, who understand the timeless, uh, the, the other forms of beauty, beauty, sorry, and uh, who you, you, you feel that they understand goodness and uh, truth, okay? So uh, the foundation trilogy, I agree with you, is a, uh, it's a nicer universe. It's, it's something that is more platonic, it's clear for me. And uh, Dune is more Aristotelian uh, because for Aristotle, uh, most are born to be slaves and only a minority are born to be masters. Hmm. Okay, if you want to put the, that once again, that dialectics between Aristotle and Plato. And let's not forget that Plato called ironically Aristotle the intellect. Okay, and uh, when they interact with each other 24 centuries ago. So let's not forget that intellect is not very advanced in the platonic epistemological uh, uh, development. Okay, so by calling Aristotle the intellect, <laughs> it was an insult because he said to Aristotle, you're only at the second stage of my epistemological map. <laughs> uh, the second on six. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Rohit has uh, a question. Rohit, you can uh, you can ask your question if you're uh, you're just on mute right now, though. Hi, Kwan. I'm wondering if you've ever uh, heard the story of Lawrence of Arabia. Tias, I forget forget his name exactly, but have you ever seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia? Yes, absolutely, a masterpiece. Yeah, there's some interesting uh, allegories. History. Lousy history for sure, but some interesting <laughs> allegories between the two stories of uh, Dune and uh, Lawrence of Arabia, if you think about it. Uh, can you, uh, can I you agree expand upon you. that a bit, or, or, or you, would you rather Quan uh, just develop his thoughts? Oh, on? no, no, uh, let Rohit uh, Ro do it. Hmm. Uh, so, like, if you think about it, uh, the Paul Atreides, he's sort of uh, the Lawrence figure. And then uh, at, the, at the end of the day, he uses the uh, the inhabitants of Arrakis uh, to take power, but then ends up uh, betraying them all. That's one thing I was thinking. Absolutely. The Freeman, okay? Because the Freeman and Paul Atreides is, uh, I agree with you, absolutely, okay? The British use uh, those people to uh, to to destroy the Ottoman Empire, okay? And Paul Atreides use the Fremen of the Dune universe to destroy the Corino Empire and to establish his own Atreides Empire, as you understood perfectly. Exactly. 
Interesting. And uh, and I, I want to go back to the missionaria protectiva, okay, which is the uh, the the manipulation tool of the Bene Gesserit. Uh, I read late. I reread lately a special report uh, of the La Roche organization, uh, the Executive Intelligence Review, and it's about. Uh, I, I think it has been published in December 2000, and it's about who is making. Uh, religious conflict uh, conflict in the Middle East, okay? And uh, if you read those shenanigans, it's exactly the same that the Bene Gesserit would do in the Dune universe mm. in order to manipulate tribal peoples so they wouldn't be used uh, to fight against uh, their opponents within the empire. Mm. Can I uh, ask something? Um, maybe another fictional uh, universe that's very uh, much kind of predictive programming, uh, but more recent. Um, the the television, or I guess it wasn't television, it was HBO or something like that, um, which I guess is television. Uh, the uh, Battle, Battlestar Galactica. I don't know if anybody saw that. The, the recent Battlestar Galactica, uh, to me, it has a lot of similarities um a little bit to dune but but more to more recently the kind of transhuman development uh uh that 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 guy you mentioned noval harari uh loves so much uh and in battlestar galactica there's another universe being built um uh, you know fictionally where where the the history of humanity is actually kind of with robots and fake people and and you know eventually becoming us and uh, I just find that really kind of disgusting but but it, it's much more <clears throat> um, it's much more recent and and these like I'm wondering about these people like like Herbert and and Asimov like they seem almost prescient hmm. And, and do you think they really were, or did they have knowledge or information that most of us, of course, didn't have uh, yeah. for, for most of our lives? Like, like uh, there's so many things that are kind of not, not coming true, but in a way they're, they're, they're evident today. Well, was, was it just that they knew about uh, Plato or was there more? Uh, I would I think say yeah, as I would have had a lot of access to uh, to information that uh, was not public, scientific information in particular. Yeah, I, I believe that's probably right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd be sure. Of it. And let's not forget the case of Jules Verne. Okay, Jules Verne wrote a lot of things in the 19th hmm. century, which became true a century later. Yeah. But but I guess what um, I'm curious after listening to uh, Juan is, is just uh, what do you think? I don't know if this is sort of what, what Juan was thinking about and correct me if I'm wrong, but do you mean to say Juan, like, are you asking did Asimov and did uh, Frank Herbert, what type of knowledge did they have of the sort of systems that we know today are operational for good and for bad, such that they were able to write these things in the way that they did that had a certain insight or prescience to it? Is that what you're asking? Like, what did they know? What were they a part of? Or was it just sort of? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I'm kind of asking that. I, you know, when you read other people from the Aldous Huxley's to the, to the um, uh, George Orwell's to the um, uh, who's uh, what's the guy from the 19th century? H.G. No. Wells well, and all of that. Yeah. Like, how were they? Were they part of what the like the oligarchy? And 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 they kind of knew what was coming down the line in it, either because they knew it was coming or because it's what always had been coming, and and they were they were wow. just putting it yeah. out there in a way. Like I don't know, the demons usually do. Uh, they tell you what they're going to do. <laughs> another, I feel, possibi I, I, another possibility uh, there is simply hopeful projection. Yeah. Well, these but are I would say, possibilities. Uh, actually, which, yeah. which, 
which in a sense is a form of control anyway you're putting it out there with you know with the with the desire to influence it's like a future. suggestive power yeah yeah yeah, yeah. plus it, you know and it, it appears in retrospect it can easily appear like prescience right yeah the three names you mentioned last for example hg wells and uh, um the, the the huxley's i think matthew certainly has laid out a, a strong case that these people were part of an oligarchical way of viewing the world and trying to bring it under their control okay yeah. now that's that's different from just mere prescience and uh you know guessing at what might happen in the future or laying it out etc cetera, etc cetera. they're in actually the part of what's going on uh well let's not forget that i started the presentation by uh offering the hypothesis that uh herbert would be the singer of the close oligarchy and i mm would make the hypothesis that he has been hired probably by the oligarchy a little bit like H.G. Wells has been hired by the mm. British oligarchy in the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century by the Fabian Society and that, that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, the, right. the, Clif the, the Clifton gang and uh, the, the round table machin, etc. okay? Uh, I... I make I don't have absolute proof, but I make the hypothesis because of the organic internal logic of uh, the Dune series mm. that he has been offered a kind of framework to create an ode to that oligarchy. Mm. In the case of Asimov, I would be uh, more inclined to recognize that he was a genius. I think Marty, had a, I Marty had, a, had a thought he wanted yes. to uh, contribute. Um, I'm very familiar with Asimov, and Asimov was very open about um, Foundation. And Foundation is not just a trilogy. Asimov wrote a whole series of later Foundation novels, 30 years later, which are all terrible, unreadable novels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and... But it, he saw it all as an organic whole, and because he had a huge raging ego, and because he was a lousy scientist and a lousy human being, uh, he, did, uh, uh, he, he thought they were as brilliant as the original ones. He wrote the original ones in his 20s. He wrote them very shortly, and he was still unpretentious at that time, and he was heavily influenced and even controlled, not by the deep state, but by our, the greatest of all science fiction editors, uh, John Campbell of Amazing Stories, who also uh, worked hugely closely with Robert Heinlein, uh, uh, Van Der Veen, I stand to be correct in the name, who produced the great Slan novel and others like that. And Campbell kept him tight, kept him short, kept asking him the key questions but the key point here is where did the inspiration consciously come from and he's open about this he had a story to write he wanted to make some money from it he was still an impecunious student he was already a brilliant talented young writer and like philip k dick and heinlein and other geniuses he was writing for pennies for cents so he and he's also studying for a science degree at boston university so what does he or columbia university sorry he later taught at boston so what does he do? To get an idea, he opens up the encyclopedia at random. And it opens up on a color page, which fits because, you know, color pages in those days especially were thicker. And if you threw a book open at random, you could open it. And what was the picture on the color page? Roman soldiers marching. And because Asimov was young and still unpretentious and uncomplicated, he gets a simplicity idea of genius. He says, wow, I'll take Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and my plot's already written for me, saves me work, and I'll make the Roman Empire in space. It'll be the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in 20 pages. And that's where it started from. Yes. And he had no conception of a trilogy or a series to begin with. And if you look at the way the books are cobbled together, they were all indeed, as uh, Juan rightly points out, they start as separate stories 
And uh, 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 eventually it's the editors in the 1950s who get with him put it together and they think a trilogy sounds pretentious and we want pretension because science fiction was still regarded as being like pornography and comic books. It was not serious literature. It was not serious art. It was for these silly little boys like Isaac Asimov or these silly young men who we don't have to take serious like Robert Heinlein. That was the universal literary attitude uh, even after Wales and even after Verne towards, uh, towards science fiction. And in fact, if you look even in the 1950s and 60s, John Wyndham, an enormously important and deep and significant uh, visionary and prophet in science fiction, uh, doesn't call his book sci-fi. He's very open about why. He says, because I wrote sci-fi novels and pop boilers in the 1930s and none of them sold. And I realized I had to sound more pretentious so I'm not calling it sci-fi. And his works are still masterpieces to this day. Uh, the but, uh, but I think what I think is happening with Asimov, and certainly Herbert, and most definitely with Wyndham, is the, uh, another key factor here that is central to uh, uh, what uh, 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 you folks, and especially you, Matt, and you, Cynthia, always talk about, the nature of the crucial central role of prophet, poetic vision. And what is poetic vision? Uh, these people are all in a way prophets. And much as I loathe H.G. Wales because of his socialism, his love of, of genocide in the Soviet Union, his hatred of human freedom, his most of all, his unbelievable pessimism and everything he writes. But he, 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 was, uh, he obviously had more than a flash of genius to him. He foresees world wars. He writes novels about nuclear energy in 19, nuclear bombs in 1914 called significantly The World Set Free. People fly and buy planes and the atomic bomb they can hold in their hands, which actually you could almost do with a hydrogen bomb today. And you drop it out of a biplane and you obliterate a city. And he writes this in 1914, more than a century ago. Mm. And he's a loathsome human being with loathsome ideas. So how, how does he get these things right? And I think the answer is these people have a prophetic sense to them, a poetic system. They tap into the Akashic record. They tap into the poetic sense of eternity. And Asimov has this too. I mean, and it's when Asimov is young and unpretentious and simple and writes simple novels full, full of jokes that he's at his clearest and his best. And if you look at the later novels, they're awful, they're unreadable. To me, they're, uh, they're even worse than Soul Bellow. And that for me is the lowest of the low. You know? <laughs> what do you, what yeah. do you think about, what do you think about the uh, robot uh, books? Cause I know that he, uh, Asimov, uh, you know, in a way uh, before the end or maybe after the end, um, all of the novels, all of the books of Asimov, including all the foundation, subsequent so-and-sos and all the robot series is uh they were meant to be kind of like this grand opus all put together in in this this in, uh, total universe and which I, I don't i don't think was very successful i didn't read them all uh, just too much but uh what do you think about Man, that? you're right but that's because he himself lied about this he wanted to be seen for most of his life as this great thinker and he's at his best when he's not. The robot oh. stories are originally written totally independent of Foundation. And it's only later he tries to knit them together in an overwhelming whole. And as you say, he totally screws it up. It's embarrassingly, <laughs> hideously bad. But the other uh. thing about the robots is this. Asimov loves AI, and it's very interesting. There is no sense of intelligent alternative organic life in the universe anywhere in Asimov. There is only humanity. He writes one wonderful story about energy intelligences. Uh, call, uh, and it, it's actually inspired by Nietzsche significantly enough. Uh, 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 and it, it, it's it's uh, what, 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 what was that? Uh, 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 the gods themselves. That's what it's called. The gods themselves. The point being, and it's and Nietzsche, of course, stole it from the Greeks. Of course, he stole it from the Greeks. Against stupidity, the gods themselves. I think struggle that was in Schiller. Vain. No, yeah. you're right. But, but the, I, I, I think the Greeks may have said it too. But it would be typical of Nietzsche to steal it from Schiller, from better <laughs> men in either case. That's exactly it. 
But uh, uh, as uh, you contrast this with Larry Niven, uh, who uh, by himself and working with Jerry Purnell uh, does the most wonderful novels about how intelligent, organic life is, uh, its perceptions of the universe and its social organization is shaped by its own organic experience. He has tribes of intelligent elephants invade the earth, and it ought to be ludicrous, but the two, uh, he, uh, Niven and Purnell make it work wonderfully. And there is a wonderful novel of first contact with a totally alien species uh, in, uh, in their own empire uh, 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 series. And I'm sorry, I've usually have a mental block in the name of the World Company, but it's by Niven and Purnell, and they, they did two novels. Of, the are you talking are about the moat and God's Eye, Martin? Yes, that's exactly it, the moat and God's Eye, which is wonderful. But the point is, in Asimov, there is none of the sense you get from other great science fiction writers of other intelligent organic forms being out there in the universe. But we know that they're even here on the earth. If you look at ants, ants have uh, make a fool of certainly Jewish theology and most of Christian theology too, because they have uh, social hierarchies and organizations and specialization within their societies and do enormous public works and have mass conscription of armies and defend their territories. Okay. And we should have known this at least for the last 150 years, if not 300, since uh, uh, Leuven Hopf developed the microscope back in uh, uh, the, the Netherlands. But again, it's very interesting to see what the great visionaries don't see as well as what they do see. But Asimov's genius comes in, and I see Asimov, uh, one last point on this, I see Asimov as a brilliant uh, human satirist and social critic, like Orwell or Zamyatin. And as, uh, when it comes to actually understanding life in the universe, he's a joke. <laughs> uh, but uh, when, uh, the, the, uh, and the other key point is when, uh, uh, when I was young, I worshipped, I love, I still love the novels. I think they're great fun. I reread them endlessly just for sheer pleasure. But I, when I was young, I worshipped the British Empire and the United, New American Empire uncritically. And I thought, obviously, we're the first and second foundations. This is a good thing, right? A very good thing. It's God's plan and we're, we're fulfilling mm. it. But now I have a, a very different view on it. And it's this. Wait, my, I'm and sorry, I, my high oh, school. Oh, yeah, just the last point. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, psychohistory uh, doesn't work even uh, within the trilogy. It requires yeah. the deep state. That is what the second foundation is. The second foundation <laughs> is the deep state. It is Plato's guardians. It cheats. It kills and it manipulates. It assassinates. It starts revolts. It's very, this is all explicitly even admitted in the second foundation of the third uh, and uh, it Martin, does uh, Martin, the Selden okay, plan Martin, on track. Martin. The Selden plan does not work on pure science and mathematics. It requires human intervention. In other would, words, they're neocons. They're would, neocons. Would, and I can assure you, the neocons uh, do see themselves as the first foundation. Uh, they talk about this among themselves. Well, Quan, would you uh, like to, uh, to address? Because there are certain diver divergent interpretations that Martin has, has raised. Would you like to... Uh, Indeed, there are. Uh, absolutely. I, I am absolutely grateful for the long intervention by Martin. Because precisely, uh, because, ahead, exactly. because, uh, because I would like to make my thesis clear. And a piece of art like a novel or a novel of science fiction, yeah. for example, is something that would act on your mind. And I think yes. that the interpretation by Martin is absolutely awesome because it can be interpreted in that sense. And, exactly. And, and it depends if you project a fake democratic universe or you project a true democratic universe or even mm -hmm. an aristocratic universe. Because let's never forget that my main message is that everything that you see, either a painting, a novel, uh, listening to a piece of music, discussing with people, the reality that will appear for you is the reality of your epistemological development. And th that is here that I think that when Martin said that uh, Asimov uh, uh, described 
by the second foundation, the deep state, I think it's absolutely very interesting because we go back once again to the notion of intention. The organization of the second foundation can certainly be uh, uh, associated with the existence of a deep state. And I, and I think it's not absurd. But if the intention is aristocratic, meaning motivated by creativity, inventivity, and playful exploration, it is not necessarily the deep state. Because let's not forget that in French, there is a word, that, there are two words which are completely opposite, but who are related by uh, the mode of operation. Okay, The mode of operation can be secret. But when the intention is not good, it's called a cabal. In English, you have the word the cabal. But when the intention is good, it's called a cenacle. Okay, I think in English it's also a cenacle. So once again, I want to go come back to the one of the Platonic major lesson, which is what is your epistemological development, which is not only your intellectual capacity and your mathematical capacity, but are you motivated by expanding knowledge and with sharing that knowledge with other people and to expand their freedom rather mm. than to have control over them. And here, I am so grateful for, to, uh, to Marty for bringing that alternative interpretation, okay? Because that alternative interpretation is certainly legit, but I think that it would uh, bring down uh, the philosophical lesson than to think that the second foundation is the deep state only, okay? The key word here is only, because uh, the, your universe is the universe created by your epistemological level. And uh, one last word. Uh, Maris also said something very important. Uh, I don't know the, in detail the biography of Asimov. I know he was born in 1920 and he died in 1992. Uh, and he was a scientist too. But suppose that he was truly a lousy human being. That lousy human being had moment of poetic revelation, okay? And as Marty said, when he was young, he was more open to those uh, poetic revelations. Okay? He was capable to be uplifted to the aristocratic and true democratic level, to use Platonic lexicon. But it doesn't mean that he was capable to, to stay there. And it's part of the epistemological work than to be uplifted because life will give you moments of uplifting to the aristocratic and true democratic uh, levels but from those uh, opening into reality deeper reality there is a work that you have to do in order to maintain yourself at those lofty levels and once again that's why i uh, absolutely encourage people to read plato because in his dialogues he was tackling all those uh, details in the epistemological journey, meaning that you can have uplifting moments and windows into deeper realities. But if you don't work on yourself, you won't fall. And I stop here for now. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it was interesting that, that as uh, Marty refer, inferred that even some of these neocons use or are inspired by their interpretation of Asimov's foundation um, amongst themselves, but they're also in inspired by their interpretation of Plato's Republic. And sure enough, whether John Ruskin or whether we're looking at a lot of these uh, inner echelon neocons, they do consider themselves guardians of the, uh, of the literalist reading of Plato's Republic. But they hate the Platonic method, and they, they hate the idea of the true philosopher being obliged to go back into the cave to help release the other cave dwellers from belief in the shadows, which is what Plato says through Socrates in the Republic, and they choose to ignore that, instead relying on this interpretation of, let's just think on a higher level in order to control the shadows and keep the, uh, the, shadow, the cave dwellers our slaves.
so it's again this question of you what is your spirit of uh that's shaping the lens when you're reading such works whatever they may be mm. and uh exactly. there's there's some ambiguity there which is which is fun and mm. and let's not forget that the oligarchy managed to to make plato appear as a fascist okay mm. which is probably one of their most uh, uh, extraordinary successes nowadays yeah Another point to make uh, on that is if you even look at the history of the sci-fi genre in general, uh, looking back at writers such as H.G. Wells and dystopian classics as well, you can see that they're all a form of uh, predictive programming in a sense. Mm. Mm. Yes. Mm. They, they can be seen that way, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. But I'll, um, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make a comment on that, Kwan, and it's going to be a little bit of a mundane one, if you like, but uh, in terms of um, <laughs> the movies that have been made of Dune, now, uh, um, Martin might be able to make a comment on this. He actually enjoyed the first movie, as I did from an entertainment point of view, but I remember walking out of the movie feeling very disappointed because, to me, um, two-thirds of that movie, the beginning and the end, telling the story of the changeover from the House of Atreides, et cetera, et cetera, and Paul Maldiv coming back as the, you know, the potential emperor that he became. The middle part, which is about a third, maybe less, of the movie, is both Paul and Jessica's awakening to the Fremen culture, the epistemology, their level of knowledge, their understanding of the planet that they actually come from. Um, and what that led to including and I, I distinctly remember in the book there were certainly passages where paul was thinking through the possibilities of the um the prophecy of bene gesserit etc etc him being the quidditch uh, quidditch his and what taking control of june would mean taking control of the spice taking literally control of the one thing that the entirety of the empire needed which brought about as you say in the following books, which I haven't, I don't have great memory of all of the following books. It's the first one that I'm uh, aware of. In the film, that was superficially treated. In the first one, um, you know, an understanding filmmaking and costs and everything like that, I can understand it. It leads me to make the comment that I'm really looking forward to the next episode of the current version of June to see just how far they go with that interaction, that mix, if you like, of the. Uh, um, empire culture with the Fremen culture that produces uh, Paul Maldib. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it fits in with everything that you're talking about in terms of epistemology. And I have to say that having listened to this today and listening to your um, ideas on what you got out of June as a prelude to what we're going to do next, in other words, go back and have a look at some Plato, um, I feel like, you know, just listening to what you've said today, I am in such a, a better position um to be prepared for what's coming next to really dig yeah. deep into some plato now to understand yeah, how the connection between june and your thinking in relation to epistemology the aristocratic man and everything that you've spoken about for quite a while now um yeah. makes me excited i, I suppose you know yeah. prepared for what's it, coming next same way yeah in a certain sense because uh let's not forget that either dune or the tr foundation trilogy is uh how can i say it uh it's making the apology of the oligarchy, okay? Even in the second foundation, even if in the second foundation is more open than due. Uh, so ultimately, ultimately, I would say that I would I want to say two things about my discussion tonight with you guys. One, uh, no one is responsible for your epistemological journey except yourself. Except yourself, yes. And second, the reality that you can see from anything, a piece of art or simply ordinary reality, wouldn't be shaped by your epistemological development. And uh, that is the uh, more complicated way, as I, I always speak in a complicated manner, that you see the reality through your lenses, okay? And your lenses is your epistemological development. Because once again, body mind okay body is not too com well it's complicated but it's less complicated than mind and mind has for plato and for confucius and I answered indirectly to stephen uh because you sent a message that uh, if it's uh, interpreted through the confucian framework it would would it be different no because uh the six platonic stages are also the six 
Confucian stages, okay? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. what, Plato, what Plato call uh, Acacia one and two and Pistis and uh, uh, Dianoa Dialecticon and uh, Theoria, uh, Confucius used six uh, stages of symbolic ages, which are 15 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, and 70 years old. So the Confucian map for the epistemological development and the, and the Platonic map for epistemological development are in a very uncanny mm -hmm. way, the same. So uh, it means beauty, goodness, and truth are the same everywhere on this planet. Am I wrong in remembering that Plato and Confucius were writing at around about the same time, 600 BC? Well, well Confucius 551 to 479 BC, Plato 427 to 347 uh, BC. Okay, so from our perspective, where we are now, that's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well... Yeah. It's, well, it's interesting, well, interesting that such ideas are circulating on uh, both sides of the planet. Well, you know that it's called the Axial Age, okay? Yeah. That yeah. famous period around five centuries before the Christ, you have a kind of blossoming of many civilizations on Earth mm -hmm. having a quantum leap to a higher epistemological level that we steal the hairs, the control hairs to that epistemological uh, map because we did not achieve everything that those guys proposed 25 yeah. centuries ago. Yeah, because as well as Plato and uh, Confucius, you have Gautama Buddha. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I dare say that he also proposed an epistemological map, which is exactly on the six stages too yeah yeah, yeah. interesting yeah uh, kevin did you have a, a thought yes yes um well i don't think it would be uh, a proper discussion about doing it if we didn't uh tackle the god emperor of doom and i uh, think uh, yes. <laughs> i think uh, <laughs> yes. you would agree with me that it's one of the centerpiece of the the whole series right so, Absolutely, I bless you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would uh, one question I would ask you about this, and we had a little bit of uh, a discussion uh, about that on uh, the other day, is uh, the discussion about Leto two. So, I have two questions about this. Um, first of all, can you uh, explore his personal uh, epistemological development uh, as the God Emperor of the whole universe, right? And um, if you feel like it's proper, maybe expand on the uh, the parallels that you made with uh, Mao Zedong, actually. Oh my God. <laughs> let's, start, <laughs> let's start with Leto the second of the house Atreides. Okay, f first, uh, first, he's a very abnormal human being, okay, because the novel, he lived 3,525 years, okay? He was born in the year 10,206 after the guild, and he died in 13,700 and something. So uh, why, did he why did he live 35, uh, 300, uh, 35 centuries first? Because he was an extreme case of uh, the properties of the melange, extending life, but also, uh, and here you have to accept the sci-fi uh, contextualization, that he merged his body with the uh, body of the sun worms, and they form a kind of uh, hybrid organism, okay? Uh, allowing him to live 35 centuries, and he just kept a part of his face and his human brain, okay, Con connected to the many neural nodes of the sandworms, okay? So that is the sci-fi dimension that we have to accept, okay? Uh, but on the philosophical level, uh, let's not forget that that guy became emperor of the known universe at 10 years old, okay? Since he, be he accepted the throne in uh, 10,216 at 10 years old. And there is the other thing that we have to remember. 
his wisdom is not coming from the fact that he is 10 years old. Because one of the property of the spies of the melange is to allow you to connect with the memories of your ancestors to the beginning of the humanity. And because of this accumulated, but not only accumulated, because it's not enough to have a humongous memory. You also need to synthesize and to understand all that memories. And in that case, we have to accept that he was kind of a genius. Second point. I said that Jung is an ode to the close oligarchy because the, the, the God Emperor Leto II wanted to control mankind for 35 centuries to repress the energy of that mankind precisely. So that when he wouldn't die, because he knows that he wouldn't die one day, mankind would be wiser because they have been in a certain sense repressed during 35 centuries. And I would say that it's an all to close oligarchy because it's not the business of anyone to control other human beings. Because I, I go back to my main premise, your epistemological development is your own responsibility and you will see reality through your lenses of epistemological development. Frank Herbert, uh, present Leto, Leto II as a kind of loving human being, but a little bit tyrannical. Uh, my hypothesis, once again, that Frank Herbert is a tool of the Anglo-American empire, mm. having created an, a marvelous tool of predictive programming and of brainwashing, okay? Because let's not forget that an English speaking, a British, an Australian, or an American person reading that at 12 years old, or 13 years old, or 14 years old, or 15 years old, would be completely identified to that idea of empire, okay? Because after all, all the people in the novel are from his own ethnic background, okay? If I were not Chinese by ethno-control background, I would have been drowned in that very easily. Hmm. And uh, that's what I call high quality dope or high quality shit. If you are not culture, epistemologically advanced enough to see the trap. Um, the link with Mao Zedong, uh, I, 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 I fear that my answer on this would be very weak. Uh, first, Mao Zedong lived only 83 years since he was born in 1893 and he dies in 1976. So he did not have the, the, the luck, or I don't know if it's a luck, to live 35 centuries. Uh, but what is clear between Mao Zedong and Leto II is a certain proclivity to impose his will, that's for sure, okay? Uh, I would say that, and here it's my personal interpretation, I would say that uh, China was at a moment of unraveling and of uh, a deep decadence. So a certain restructuration was needed in my understanding. And if Mao Zedong were not followed by Deng Xiaoping, and Deng Xiaoping was not followed by Jiang Zemin and by uh, Xi Jinping, uh, it would have been a tragedy for me. So I prefer to see Mao Zedong as being the first step of a evolution in the Chinese society uh, because of that historical context. And uh, I see this, I see Mao Zedong as being the first link of something bigger that I call the CCP and not the CPC, because most of the Anglo-American propaganda would call the CPC, which is the right order, the CCP, just to offend them. 
but not for me, because the CPC means the Communist Party of China, and the CCP means the Chinese Civilization Party. And I much prefer mm. the CCP, the Chinese Civilization Party, because I see Mao Zedong as the first step in the restoration of the classical Chinese civilization, promoting that true epistemological journey, as has been mapped by Confucius 25 centuries ago, and having his equivalent in his Western broader, Plato. Quite, quite a uh, an interesting interview with uh, Frank Herbert, uh, with something that's pretty much word for word your thesis in the chat there I posted. Oh, yeah? Okay. Would you develop that, please? Uh, I'll just read it out for you. Uh, I'll just read the second paragraph. Then this was one of my themes for Dune. Don't give over all your critical faculties to people in power, no matter how admirable those people may appear to be. Beneath the hero's facade, you will find a human being who makes human mistakes. Enormous problems arise when human mistakes are made on the grand scale available to a superhero. And sometimes you run into another problem. It It's demonstrable that the power structures tend to attract people who want power for the sake of power, and that a significant portion of such people are imbalanced in a word, insane. Yeah, absolutely cool. <laughs> absolutely cool. Okay, once again, I, 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 I am the parrot of myself. Your epistemological yep. journey is your own responsibility, is the responsibility of no one else. Hmm. Yep. Susie, did you have a, a thought? We are the saviors we have been waiting for. We are the teachers we have been waiting for. It's so cool. I was listening to one of your recent interviews, Matt, and you brought up that idea of the mandate of heaven again. And it seems obvious to me that in all the propaganda we're having to endure, about China and Russia. China and Russia are standing their ground and will not allow their nations and their civilizations to be stripped apart by this oligarchy. And all of the countries that are controlled by this oligarchy have truly come to the end of the line. There is no mandate of heaven for them to continue as they have it's done yeah i'm absolutely we are in, I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry we are in me. a season where true epistemological development is being offered promoted encouraged for us again and there are so many of you out there that have been on this journey that the rest of us didn't even know about. I've only known about you for what, about six months? So yeah, there's still gonna be a lot of shaking, but we have an exciting future ahead of us. We get to rebuild this thing and see truth and beauty and justice elevated in our world once again, instead of constantly being suppressed and assassinated. Now I'm done. <laughs> uh, I have 10 seconds. I am very excited by what Susan just said. That, and I, I want pe you, pe you guys to understand that I'm not saying that to dampen the mood, but the creation of aristocratic and true democratic man is a vital necessity. But the fight against the oligarchy, in my understanding, would not be solved in the next generation. Okay, It would be a Monty generational task and it's not to be pessimistic than to say that okay it's simply to see reality as it is because those people would not bow out graciously let's be lucid hmm. a thought go dave um two thoughts i don't know which one should come first but i was thinking about one of the advantages, actually, Matt, I saw 
uh, interview you did, I didn't get to hear it, but you, it was something like, why does the oligarchy always win or, or something like that? No, I wouldn't, have done, I wouldn't have done that. I, I maybe why, why is there an oligarch or why is oligarchy? Or How something? does it survive? Okay. All right. I was thinking, well, there's a simple answer, um, which is that they view their identity in generational terms right? Like there, it's really about a long line going very far back and going very far forward. Now compare that with the average, say, uh, democratic man, right? In Plato's terms, who really just thinks about uh, what he or she likes, right? What pleases them and the things that they like are, are the good things and the things that they don't like, those are the bad things. And much of their life is organized around getting the things that they like and supporting those things which seem to um, support their interests and uh, discouraging the things that seem against their self-interest. Uh, but it's very, it's very based in the present, right? So they have no sense of historical identity. Now, how the hell can somebody who thinks like that ever compete against a different class which you know thinks of itself in terms of centuries and, and millennia right uh, even if they've been around or not you know they're projecting very far into the future that's just how they're they're reared and so the question of identity as opposed to you know even whatever good intentions or whatnot people have depending on where their identity is uh, that's going to have a huge impact on how they think about developing themselves and the quality of their actions, right? Their, 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 the quality of their creativity. You know, is it just, uh, so I guess we could, we brought up like H.G. Wells, right? Martin brought up H.G. Wells, who's very, uh, I would say, uh, techne, right? He had a very strong techne, uh, Greek term, the craft, right? He's a very good craftsman. Uh, writes very uh, in a, in a very compelling way and creates or adapts myths in a very um, compelling and original manner. Um, and he does have this sense of thinking forward and past. There's something missing, right, in terms of like the deeper genius, which demonstrates why that's 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 false. You're you're. On an epistemological level, your fundamental idea of the universe is actually wrong, which is why, at the end of the day, evil keeps having to regroup, right, over long arcs of history. Like, they're still trying to do the same thing that they've been trying to do for a really long time. And, you know, like the Davos crowd, it, it seems a bit shaky these days, right? It doesn't, you don't hear the confidence uh, in the voices so much. It's much more, it sounds more cautious. Um, so I guess last thought base is, is the idea of humility, um, in Confucius's words, the superior man in respect to what he does not know, which is a cautious reserve. And so these evil folks, they do have strategically, a, a, a more developed identity, or they have a, a, a better sense of time. Uh, but they also think that they actually know more about the deeper truths than they really do. Whereas a more humble person may not have all those advantages or have been reared in as, you know, kind of strict a way. Uh, but if they discover that deeper, uh, you know, Socratic Confucian sense of, of humility or Christian sense of humility, um, you know, and, and recognizing even if they've held something for a really long time, they're able to change that's a qualitatively different uh, kind of power. Anyway, so I thought this is my thoughts. Yes. Uh, may I uh, add something about that? Yeah, I was, I was riffing. Yes. Okay. Uh, you were referring very rightly to the idea of uh, generations, okay? Uh, being together for a common project within the oligarchy. Uh, I would say that now, precisely, 
in this uh, geopolitical context, you have uh, three major nations on earth having a very long tradition in terms of history and in terms of culture, uh, who are saying no to that oligarchy now, okay? And those three nations are named China, Russia, and Iran. And it goes back to what you said, uh, the democratic man need a certain protection to develop himself epistemologically speaking. And those three nations that I call in a very grandiose manner, nations, empire, civilizations have the needed cultural framework and what I would say, uh, the economical and political framework to protect their own democratic, democratic man in order that they climb the ladders or the stages of their own epistemological development. Because of accident of history, the last two centuries have been monopolized by the Anglo-American oligarchy. And they thought that they were winning and because of that hubris precisely, they were not as, uh, uh, as prudent, as careful, as if they had true peer competitors. And now they are three peer competitors, three nation empire civilization, once again, China, Russia, Iran, and what I mean, nations, empire, civilization, meaning group of people having the control power, the economical power, the political power, the diplomatic power, and the soft power, which is a little bit more than the control power, okay? Because control power is within that nation and the soft power is the expansion of that control power, but outside that, that mm -hmm. nation that would be capable to put some limits to the Anglo-American oligarchy. And I don't wish them harm. I wish simply that they understand that there are other people on this planet having the right to develop too, because what is what is at stake here is the right to development, okay? Not only on a personal level in terms of epistemological development, but level. also in terms of economical development and political development, which is not done as a subordinate entity to that, let's say Anglo-American, uh, oligarchy, or to go back to my sophomoric uh, acronym, the KFC Azael, the Pakistocratic feudal conglomerate of the anglo zio american establishment. Well said. Hmm. Uh, Stephen, I saw your, your digital hand up for a while. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, uh, Quan, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, my question kind of builds on uh, some of the thoughts of Marty and others in terms of these writers having been, and other science fiction writers having been so prescient. I wonder if they didn't tap into something or or, um, or, or got into some sort of uh, higher knowledge. If, if you look at kind of the uh, Marty's thoughts on the second foundation of the deep state, or maybe we could look at Dune as uh, Paul Atreides breaking away from the Bene Generis at, uh, machinations and long-term plans, is it possible to draw a parallel to what we see in the world today and, and what Matt and, and Cynthia have discussed in terms of the conflict of the, the uh, two major opposing forces, the oligarchical Malthusians versus, um, for lack of a better term, the good guys? Can we infer behind the scenes potentially the hidden hands of either two covert entities or groups, or perhaps one with a factional conflict going on, or is that just uh, um, a wishful thinking and analogy on my part? Uh, I, I think that you're not at all delusional by saying that, uh, Stephen, because uh, uh, one of the classical or archetypical, I prefer to say archetypical, typical maneuver of oligarchy is to create A and minus A. 
okay, and to push A and minus A once against the other, making people think that they struggle for the right, the right side, if you want, okay? Uh, the left and the right, and even if I have a weakness for the foundation trilogy, uh, maybe it's two novels coming from the oligarchy, making people one against the other, okay? Because that's the archetypical maneuver of the oligarchy. We always have to keep that in our mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marty, uh, just pointed out um, in the chat box saying, again, I fully agree with you, but I would at least add two more civilization centers, Spanish Latin America, primarily Mexico, Argentina, Chile, and Peru, and India. And of course, we have the Arab world if it survives as a coherent state or assembly of states. Well taken. Uh, thank you, Martin, for adding that, because uh, sometimes I have biases that I recognize. And Rohit stated, uh, Jesuit always sounded similar to Jesuit to me. And frankly, I also, my mind went there as well. Um, especially My mind went to just the... about every secret society. I can't help it. I'm broad. Yeah, maybe it's a synthesis. But they all feed into each other one way or another anyway. Although the, the, the Jesuits weren't as, as welcome to women. But that, yeah. that aside, yeah. yeah, definitely a lot of, a lot yeah. of parallels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, all right, let, let's 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 round it out for tonight with Susie. Um, yeah, shoot. I just wanted to ask, but don't we kind of owe it to China and their Belt and Road Initiative that helped some of these other countries begin to take a stand against this system, Anglo-American, whatever you want to call it. Um, didn't they kind of give some of these other countries the courage that we can do this? One hopes so. Oh, that definitely so. Yeah, that was a big yeah. weapon, a big yeah. weapon in battle. And maybe a word of tribute to Sergei Glaziev, uh, which is the Russian at the root of the new framework for yep. the new monetary system, okay? Yep. Because that is a major tool to recreate the world uh, in more, in a fair, uh, on a fair foundation. And I think we'd have to put LaRouche in there too, wouldn't we? Didn't he lay the groundwork by all of his, he was a real ambassador. Uh, more than that, he was a philosopher king. Yes. Guys, this is good. Quan, thank you very much for opening up new vistas yet again. Every time, every time, Quan, <laughs> you, you blow my mind. You make me read more stuff. <laughs> so thank I, you so look, much. I, I would... I, I would reiterate what I said before that having watched um, uh, Quan outline his thesis in relation to those two novels, it uh, leaves me now with a much better anticipatory understanding, perhaps, of what we might get out of uh, a reading from uh, from Plato. I understand how it ties in, and I understand how the books uh, um, make that point. Mm -hmm. Well, next week yeah. we're going to begin our journey. Um, inshallah, in the first of well. As, as I said last week, whether we're going to do all three of the trilogy of the Theatetus, Statesman, and Sophist, or whether we just pick one, we'll see. We'll see. But we're definitely going to get it deep into the mind of Plato um, and bring him back to life. Not that he ever really died if we take his thesis of the immortality of the soul seriously. Um, and that'll be... So I'm going to make sure that everybody gets the text, the, the, the selected translation. We'll try to find a really good translation, not, not the crappy Benjamin Jowett Oxford dishonest son of a anyway we'll try to find something good somebody who actually likes Plato uh <laughs> when we look for our translator and uh, we'll send that out and make sure everybody gets a copy okay and then next Wednesday 8 p.m eastern standard time we'll uh, we'll meet back here so thank you everybody Perfect. thank you Juan thanks everyone yeah, thanks. Good thanks good night thanks, thanks. Good night, everyone thank you good night